Welcome. Uh, my name is Terry Bimes. I'm an associate teaching professor in the Travers Department of, of Public Policy. Of, I'm sorry, of political science at UC Berkeley. And uh, this is this forum is called Welk, um, American Democracy in the Wake of Trump, How Biden Will Govern. I thank the Berkeley Law School Public Policy and Law Program for hosting this event and the Institute of Governmental Studies and the Citrin Center for Public Opinion Research for being co-sponsors. Thanks also to Brad Barber and Drew Kloss for their help in putting on this event. Uh, today is the last full day of President Donald Trump's presidency, 13 days after the January 6th Capitol riots, and we have less than 24 hours until Joe Biden is sworn in as president. Two goals in today's panel is looking at what will be the effects of the Trump presidency on the state of politics and also democratic governance more generally. And second, looking at how the events of the last two weeks will impact Joe Biden's first 100 days. We are honored to have two excellent panelists today who can help us understand these issues and put them in historical context. Tom Mann is a distinguished affiliated scholar with the Institute of Governmental Studies. He's also the senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. He's published many books, but two of note that you may be interested in checking out. One is, it's even worse than it looks, how the American constitutional system collided with the new politics of extremism, which he co-authored with Norm Ornstein, and a second book, One Nation After Trump, which was co-authored with E.J. Dion and Norm Ornstein. Steve Hayward uh, is an author, political commentator, and policy scholar. He's a lecturer in the Berkeley Law School. And two books of his that you may want to check out are The Age of Reagan, The Fall of the Old Liberal Order, 1964 to 1980, and Churchill on Leadership, Executive Success in the Face of Adversity. So those books could be uh, very relevant in today's discussion. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask questions and I'm hoping that the audience will, will put your questions in the chat function and we'll try to incorporate your questions as we go along. So my first question is, Mitch McConnell has indicated that he thinks Donald Trump is a drag on the Republican party while other Republican members of Congress are positioning themselves to be the heir to, to Trump. What happens to the Republican party post-Trump and more pointed to this audience at the law school, how does the conservative legal movement deal with the aftermath of the Trump presidency? Are there lessons for the movement? I'm gonna let Steve take um, the lead and then we'll go to Tom and I ask each of the panelists to try to limit yourself to four minutes. Oh, well, thank you, Terry. I'm gonna run a stopwatch here and try and be good. Uh, so, uh, well, the first half of your two-part question is, a little tricky to figure out. So the dilemma for Republicans is uh, Donald Trump has arguably, I think probably expanded the base of the Republican party to some extent while losing some parts of it. And is it net larger or will it be left net larger than it was before his arrival five years ago? Uh, you know, he did bring a lot of Democrats uh, uh, to cross party lines. I recommend to uh, viewers who are interested read the book by John Shields and Stephanie Morabchik that Tom's friends at Brookings published called Trump's Democrats. Um, and will they stay with the Republican party and another candidate? Obviously there are people like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and most uh, famously who are trying to position themselves to be the successor to Trump uh, with varying degrees of success. Actually that's, uh, I think you'd say not success. Um, and meanwhile, Republicans, as we know, lost some suburban voters uh, over this last uh, four-year cycle. And are they going to be able to get them back or have they lost a lot of them for good? That's a longer running story. The erosion of Republican strength in the suburbs goes back at least to Bill Clinton in 1992, I think you'd say. Um, so a lot's going to depend, I think, and we'll come back to this in your second question, I think, second question set, Terry is uh, how's this impeachment business gonna play out over the next six weeks, six months, depending on how that happens. Um, and then the, uh, the related question is, is whether Trump is going to fade away, you know, like old soldiers, like MacArthur said, or whether he's gonna try and stay in the mix. The mischievous part of my soul, if I were a democratic strategist, would be on the phone with Twitter saying, 
could you please turn Trump's Twitter feed back on? <laughs> because, uh, you know, that is the, the way he stirs things up and he's got to find some other way to stay in the spotlight without it, which he may well do. We'll see. Um, so I think right now uh, the Republican leadership is uh, completely uncertain as to exactly what it's going to mean and how things might fall out going forward. Uh, now, the, the narrow second question is, um, you know, the federal society, the conservative movement, those are overlap but distinct things. Um, uh, I think the, um, first of all, I do want to make clear for people who don't necessarily follow this, the federal society is not like the ABA, you know, they don't rate judges or judicial candidates, they don't propose or lobby on legislation. And one of the things I'm gonna be interested in seeing uh, is you know, their annual conferences they have every year in November typically have a lot of liberals come to debate with the conservatives that form their core. So Cass Sunstein has come, uh, uh, Jeff Rosen, and go on down a list of people who've uh, participated in federal society meetings. I wonder if that will continue or whether there will be a boycott or reluctance for people to continue those kinds of debates. And conversely, will the American Constitution Society, which is the sort of smaller liberal counterpart of the Federalists, will they continue to invite conservative speakers to come? Uh, we'll see about that. Things are you know, pretty bitter and, uh, uh, at the moment. Um, the wider conservative movement um, is, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, they got their nose out of joint five years ago because Trump won the nomination without them. In fact, against the opposition of most parts of the conservative movement. And of course, they mostly fell in line behind him. And now I think the same uncertainty that people like Mitch McConnell, uh, Kevin McCarthy in the House face is also afflicting all the sort of main conservative activists and intellectual groups. So I'll have to see how things shake out is the position I'm taking at the moment. So I'll stop there and let Tom get in his licks. Great. Um, thanks. thanks. Wow. <laughs> Steve, three minutes uh, at a cheery uh, I think assessment overall for the Republicans and and the conservative movement. Uh, mine is a little more uh, pessimistic, but perhaps not in the short term. What will uh, happen? But but over the longer course, I mean, we've we've just survived a an attempted coup and had a violent insurrection in the Capitol. Um, uh, one might think it's a sign of strength uh, that we survived it, but it's important to remember that Donald Trump uh, uh, incited this, uh, uh, this insurrection and Donald Trump would have been impossible without the Republican party. Uh, Steve, it's not that they supported him as he sought the nomination. <laughs> it's that he won it over them. Um, and then they became enablers. Donald Trump wouldn't have become uh, as destructive and worrisome uh, had he faced uh, the first branch of government through its majority party that was in a position to uh, to basically constrain what he might do. I think Mitch McConnell is a very practical uh, political leader, and he figured uh, Trump's going to be with us. We're going to get whatever we can of our agenda through with him. That meant tax cuts, uh, judges, and, and a reduction in regulations, and and basically we'll try to keep any damage occurring to the Republican party itself. But in McConnell's case, there's no love of Trump. He's sort of embarrassed by his behavior and rightly so. Trump now by Gallup terms uh, has had the lowest uh, public approval ratings since polls began in the 1930s. Uh, and he's ending at it at a low point for himself uh, by Gallup, 34%. Uh, um, he has a, a very loyal and strong base, but it's, a, it's only a part of the electorate and it's uh, a slightly larger part of the Republican party. But when push comes to shove, Trump 
could not win national elections without all of those Republican identifiers voting for him, even if they uh, disliked him. And, and uh, I think that's part of the problem that we face. So the, the real question in my mind is, can American democracy succeed with the Republican Party that has for over a decade really been an insurgent outlier and, and, and not fundamentally accepting truth and science of, uh, of rejecting most of the inherited policy regime uh, and basically despising its political adversaries. Uh, that's negative partisanship. And so Democrats have returned uh, the animus uh, that's for sure, but but it's in a position now uh, uh, to see if the Republican Party wants to associate its, himself itself from Trump or really be uh, uh, be in a be in a position uh, to uh, to break away and try to have Trump be that dim memory that. Uh, we once experienced and survived. So um, just let me ask a quick follow-up. Um, after the 2012 um, election loss um, in the Republican Party, there was a post-mortem that got a lot of attention. Uh, that advice was not really followed by uh, Donald Trump, but, but will there be like a post-mortem um, after this election where the Republican Party tries to shift directions um, after these last four years, or will they sort of stay the course given that they, they picked up some seats in the House, uh, uh, you know, close uh, um, and did, did pretty well at the state level. I mean, all right, uh, very quickly, uh, I, I would think not for the simple reason, and you just put your hand, uh, put your finger on it, below the level of the presidency, the Republican Party did extremely well. Uh, I, you know, I'm tempted to taunt Tom who uh, thought it possible for decent reason that there would be a big blue wave and, Democrats were supposed to add seats in the House. Uh, they targeted and spent big money on state legislative chambers and thought it likely to take the Senate back. Uh, and, you know, they got lucky that Trump helped them get the Senate back of the Georgia runoffs. So, you know, below the level of Trump, the Republican Party, uh, in fact, I know a lot of Republicans day after the election were delighted. They thought, we, you know, Trump the albatross is now gone and the position of the party looks pretty strong. So, it's a little different than the 2008, 2012, when Republicans really got clobbered and had to rethink where their erosion with voters had been. And it's, I think we still haven't quite sorted out exactly what happened here. Is it really the case that a lot of voters split their tickets? The evidence on that looks to be mixed. But uh, so anyway, um, wait and see. Yes, yeah, Steve's, Steve's certainly right about uh about this election, but if you turn back to where Republicans were when uh, Trump ran for and won the presidency and where they are now, it's, it's not quite as good at any of those levels. They, uh, they had a larger margin in the, um, in the Senate. Um, uh, they, uh, they had a, uh, a pretty nice margin uh, in the House that then got collapsed in, uh, and destroyed in the midterm elections of 2018. Similarly, they've lost a little ground in, uh, in the state legislatures and governorships. So it's, it's up for grabs uh, in many respects. It's important uh, what the Congress uh, does now. First of all, with the impeachment trial, um, uh, I think McConnell would love for Trump to be convicted so as to send him off to his activities in Mar-a-Lago and beyond without, uh, uh, without having to be dealt with within the Republican Party. Uh, McConnell wants to run the Republican Party and have the power, and he's not all that excited about being the minority leader uh, the two Georgia seats were, uh, uh, were very important to him. It's also going to be important to see whether the House acts to evict or censure or punish in some ways the, uh, 
the nuts in the house, uh, the QAnon sympathizers from Georgia and Colorado, Mo Brooks of Alabama, who who was inciting uh, uh, the mob uh, down on the mall on the 6th. I think it's going to be important to see whether Democrats feel a need, as well as Republicans, to separate themselves, not just from Trump, but from the violent uh, far-right extreme groups who who have made a step, they've, uh, a move they've never made before. Uh, instead of bombing a government building in Oklahoma City or uh, uh, other selective matters, they really attack the Capitol. Um, and that's of a different order. And we're going to learn whether the Republican Party is prepared to be a a serious governing party, not a marginal, far right, uh, uh, minor party like like we see in Europe, but in our two party system, whether they're going to have the credibility to accept the laws and norms of this country and act as a a governing party that actually has an interest with an agenda in governing is prepared to work with the other side and to accept and to accept the legitimacy of elections. Right. Great. Great. Um, great. Well, let's get on to the second question. I, I see that. Um, thank you to the audience for posting your questions in the chat function. It seems like a lot of them have to do with the Biden administration. So I will draw upon them in the next next round of questions. Um, the subtitle of this panel is How Will Biden Govern? And I'd like to do a lightning round before I, um, before I get into the meteor questions. Um, and so I'd like you to respond, panelists, with a yes or no, uh, whether these, uh, these events, these pieces of legislation will happen during the Biden administration. So the first one is um, the end of the filibuster. Tom? Yes. Steve? I think mostly no. They may <laughs> uh, perform it, but I don't think they'll get rid of it. Uh, statehood for DC and and or Puerto Rico. Uh, yes, for DC. Um, uh, uncertain on Puerto Rico. Yeah, I think likely not. Uh, court packing. No. No, I agree with that. I don't think that'll happen either. By the way, the court's fully packed already. Trump and McConnell got a lot of judges appointed, and they're up to their eyeballs in uh, judges. No Not room. as many as FDR. FDR got all nine before he was done. <laughs> uh, what about conviction of President Trump in the Senate impeachment trial? Uh, that's Flip a, a tough coin. one. I think it, what do you say, Steve? Flip a coin. Yeah, I think that's close. I think it'll either be, you know, three Republicans come along and vote with all Democrats or or 20 plus Republicans will uh, join all the Democrats. Uh, it partly depends on on what transpires in the next week, what more we learn uh, about uh, about the president and the insurrection. Uh, but I could see a popular movement developing. Uh, and remember the, the Trump movement in terms of the popular vote, that is citizens who cast their ballots is, uh, is still very much a minority uh, uh, party and government. Uh, and we live in an era of minority control, but every once in a while, Majorities get worked out about some up about something. So I'm, I think it's possible, but a, a coin flip is probably the best bet. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like to take you a little bit more time to answer the next question. Uh, what impact do you think the January 6th riot on the Capitol uh, and Trump's impeachment will have on Biden's ability to pass his agenda in the first hundred days? And Will those events make it any easier to build bipartisan coalitions or will it distract from his ability to, to really focus on his policy agenda? 
Uh, why don't we go Tom and then Steve on this one? Okay. Uh, the context is certainly important. If if it were the same as when Obama came into uh, uh, to office, uh, Mitch uh, would do the same thing. His object would be to uh, defeat Obama's agenda as a way of regaining power uh, in the Congress and uh, eventually uh, uh, win, win the White House. But, but it is different. One, the Republicans could be in the midst of a civil war. Think 1861, uh, uh, and and that could uh, lead to some cooperation uh, among Republicans, uh, including McConnell. I could see McConnell getting behind uh, uh, a COVID bill, a vaccine bill, public health bill, as well as some jobs activities and trying to work, uh, see if some negotiations are possible on the first bill. Uh, but in the, in the end, I, I think uh, there's no market for bipartisanship among Republicans beyond what I said. That is a concern about the context, about the insurrection, uh, about the impeachment, uh, 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 will uh, and, and and certainly COVID. So we'll just have to see uh, see what's going to happen. But but I believe uh, uh, that Biden will talk unity and and play Mitch's hardball uh, when it comes to adopting the agenda. The one advantage he has. Is, is that the stuff he wants to pass is actually popular in the country. Uh, he's not a, asking them, he's not worrying about deficits and, and uh, tax increases right, right now, although he'll, he'll get to those on the upper 1% or 0.01% um, uh, eventually. But the things he's saying is we've got a crisis, people are dying. 400,000 today, uh, that mark was hit, dying in the U.S. from, uh, from the virus. So I think, I think that gives him room um, uh, to advance uh, an agenda that will attract some Republicans. Um, and on one or two items that are important, McConnell may decide to bring his some of his troops along. Steve, do you agree with Tom? Uh, part of that, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the capital riot business. Um, you know, I, I always like to think of what the historical par parallels it might be. Uh, Tom mentions 1861 when I think you meant the Democratic Party was divided, of course. Um, right. It, yeah, okay. of course. Right. And uh, I think I see part of that, uh, the, the more modern parallel, it, it's, it's not quite the same at all, but I think about the riots in Chicago in 1968 that so badly shook the Democratic Party. And yet Hubert Humphrey rallied from 20 points down to almost win that election, but it carried over after the election, of course, and those divisions in the Democratic Party that that was a part of the part of that story, though it festered for quite a long time, I think. Uh, and so that may happen with Republicans. I think Republicans are shaken by what has happened uh, specifically and more generally with Trump. And it's, we'll have to see how that settles out. I think that's connected to the impeachment question. And, you know, I could say a lot about that. I'll just say one or two things of possibilities, which is um, I could see the whole thing going away in six months for uh, several reasons. One of them is the public might say, why are we going back to this? Depending on what else may be learned, as you say, Tom. Uh, it might also be if I'm a Democrat, and I'm going to speak like a cynical political operative here, why do I want to solve the Republicans' problem for them by giving them a chance to get rid of Trump once and for all? Uh, I think you, you know, I think you know, you want to keep your opposition divided. So I mean, that's one cynical way of thinking it through. We'll see. On the spending question, I think you're quite right. Uh, you know, McConnell, uh, he's always been a big spender. Uh, I have heard secondhand he's always said no senator ever lost an election because they didn't spend enough money. Um, right. And uh, in fact, you know, I, I remember doing my research for my Reagan book on his presidency, 
finding Reagan complaining in his diary in 1986 about this gosh darn freshman senator from Kentucky who won't uphold my vetoes of big spending bills. So I think you're quite right. I think um, I think what's happening here is pretty straightforward. I think Biden's 1.9 trillion is an opening bid. Uh, and I think uh, plenty of Republicans, especially McConnell, will be happy to go along with two thirds of that amount. And so they'll be arguing over particular things uh, about you know, which particular interests and sectors are helped the most and so forth. And uh, I do hear that the Biden people would like to pass the COVID relief bill by regular order, which means subject right. to a 60 vote filibuster rather than using a reconciliation process, which I bet they want to save for bigger things, the tax changes and stuff that are, as you mentioned, the second part of it. So that's that's my analysis of the sort of state of the games that are about to unfold. You know, it's it's interesting. It turns out, Terry, that, that I think Democrats are going to get two bites of the reconciliation apple because because the Republicans didn't use theirs in the last Congress. Uh, we'll wait to see. Uh, but I think they're eventually going to be playing hardball on reconciliation. Um, uh, and they may even need, if, uh, if it's a matter of high importance to the Democrats and Republicans just are determined to filibuster it, uh, Joe Manchin now favors four trillion dollars for infrastructure spending. Uh, how about that? That's the guy who doesn't like the filibuster uh, to be reformed. Uh, so I think many things are possible. What what I emphasize is think about what we have here. Joe Biden, you know, he ran for president twice before. He was a favorite, but he was the status quo centrist, pragmatic type, the activists, the progressives were so disappointed. And yet, if you look at his appointments thus far and look at his agenda, and the agenda, by the way, is not just the coronavirus and the economic recovery. It's also racial justice and climate change. And he is pursuing a, an exceedingly ambitious agenda. If the country feels it's, it's really in trouble, uh, uh, he may, uh, he'd probably like to use 1933 and Franklin Roosevelt as a model for, uh, for his presidency. Unfortunately, he doesn't quite have the numbers in the Congress to, to pull that off immediately. But I think it should tell us that we shouldn't expect business as usual in the Congress. I think Mitch's uh, will just kill it. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. No one cares if we kill legislation, and um, I, I don't think he can do that. It's something. Several things historic have happened. We're not going to forget uh, uh, January sixth, uh, two thousand and twenty-one, for a long, long time. We've had a a racial uh, injustice awakening, and we've had a uh, uh, the resurrection of the white supremacists uh, in this country. And they have arms, and they're ready to be violent, and they're aligning with other fringe extremist groups. And this, this changes our politics. There's not going to be much normal about it which means you probably can't trust what Steve and I are saying. <laughs> just to, just a quick follow up on one point there. Well, maybe two. Um, well, I'll just say this, Tom, we can argue about this later. And yet Trump somehow got the highest share of the non-white vote of any Republican in 60 years, which still ought to be a puzzle to an awful lot of people. I have lots of thoughts on that, but I'm watching for one phrase tomorrow in the inaugural address, Tom, that bears on your point. Uh, the phrase that's been, we've heard talk about New Deal too or New De whatever. Uh, the other phrase that's been bubbling around for a while now and uh, is the Great Reset. Uh, a lot of people in Europe are saying this. A lot of bankers are saying this. I'm going to be watching to see if Biden uses that term in his inaugural address tomorrow, and that'll be a sign that uh, you're right. He's going to put the pedal to the metal on a progressive agenda. So, that, um, Tim. <laughs> sorry. 
But you, you might be able to get your point in. This, uh, this is a related question. Uh, what, this is from one of our audience members. What does the Biden administration need um, to, to accomplish to prevent radicalizing more members of the Republican Party? Uh, you know, will, he's proposing all these uh, very progressive policies. Uh, does he risk alienating and radicalizing more Republicans with those uh, agenda items? They don't need anything from Biden to further radicalize. We've had a, over a decade of the radicalization of the Republican Party. It's been well traced. There are these two guys um, in Washington uh, almost a decade ago who, who, uh, who tried to argue without convincing Steve that uh, the Republicans were... Uh, we're a radical insurgency in our politics, and I think it's it's really played out quite uh, quite actively. If you look at what Biden is proposing, uh, it's all popular. It's not he's not proposing to take people's private health insurance away from him, uh, from them. Uh, uh, people think some of the things government does is really terrific, and. Ironically, um, even some of the Trump lovers associate with Social Security and Medicare and government doing the stuff they're supposed to do. We're talking about a culture war here and per performative positions that uh, Republicans take. Steve, I think the answer to your question about, about Trump increasing uh, the, the non-whites is that is that there's a culture war going on and some African Americans and Latinos are conservative on some of the culture issues. Uh, all the while the country as a whole is moving, is moving leftward and is much more, uh, much more tolerant. So, uh, uh, well, I'll stop there. Well, you know, at, to, to quote my favorite president, there you go again, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've long, wanted, I've long wanted to do my own quantitative analysis that will generate the exact opposite result of the famous curve that you and Norm did. But I would point people to, um, you know, the Pew, I think the Pew survey people on their measures of polarization. I think they conclude that Democratic members of the House, for example, actually it's the public they measure. I think House members follow the public, that the polarization of opinion shows that uh, uh, liberals have moved further to the left than Republicans have to the right. Can fight about that all day long. Uh, my witness for this, uh, well, put it this way. How about a Democrat who once said uh, um, in voting against the Humphrey Hawkins full employment bill back in the 70s, that was a really watered down bill that didn't do very much. But this senator who voted against it said, uh, Senator Humphrey is not cognizant of the limited finite ability government has to deal with people's problems. That was Joe Biden who voted to cut capital gains taxes that year voted for all the Reagan tax cuts and was endorsed for re-election in 1978 by, guess what, Howard Jarvis. Mm -hmm. Now, Biden's great superpower is he, uh, and why he is where he is, is that he's always inhabited the center of the Democratic Party. He knows which way the party is moving and he moves that direction. All those old things, and by the way, remember he was also moderately pro-life at one point too. Uh, and so the point is, is just track Joe Biden's path and you'll see how the Democratic Party has moved. Uh, what was the other thing I was going to say about all that? Um, I, I forget what, something, but- I You want me to respond, and <laughs> or maybe Terry doesn't want me to, but I just fundamentally disagree with Steve on, on this. I've actually entered, uh, been involved in public discussions with Pew, and it turns out they're measuring, uh, in many respects, not the- the extremity of positions, but the consistency of positions uh, on, on both sides. It turns out a lot of Americans are inconsistent. They believe in a conservative position on one thing and a liberal on, on the other. That, that said, um, if you look at the extremes of the two parties, one, we shall go unnamed here, um, you know, gets itself involved in insurrections, overturning uh, the government that that thinks climate science is is a hoax, that uh, accepted Trump's lies for four years, that enabled uh, wannabe 
uh, autocrat uh, and kleptocrat and, uh, and who brought to Washington uh, the worst administration we've seen in our, in our lifetimes, uh, while Democrats are looking like a sort of center or even center right party to beef up the safety net a bit. I mean, the Republican Party, as I, as I said before, and there's been a lot of scholarship on this, Pippa Norris has summarized all of it, but the Republican Party looks like no other center-right party in democratic politics. It looks like the extreme uh, sort of far-right uh, who are annoying but aren't in power. Oh, one more little thing. Um, a very rifle shot point, Norm. Uh, sorry, Tom, Norm. It's easy to confuse you two guys, right? Um, here's something nobody knows. Uh, Basic energy research spending under the Trump administration doubled. I mean, basic materials research spending on the national labs. I'm not sure the Trump administration knows that was happening, but it did happen. I just they actually did. I know what I was going to say, Terry, about the riot business. Um, you know, things can change in a hurry. And I was just recently going through some of the literature from the early 60s about the radical right. A lot of the language now was around the early 60s. Stanley Moss, the Attorney General of California, did his breathless report about the threat from the John Birch Society. And within five or six years, and even Lyndon Johnson was saying as late as 1965, my great fear is the radical right. Of course, pretty soon it came from the radical left. No one saw that coming. I'm not predicting it necessarily, but it wouldn't surprise me if Occupy Wall Street comes back in some form or another. Just because who would have predicted A, Trump, B, a coronavirus, who the heck knows what's next. Uh, but don't be so sure that the current narrative is the one that's going to be determined what our future is, because we've seen things surprise us before. Uh, do you think Trump will be out in the in the lead on those those efforts, Steve? Uh, or no, will I mean, no, he's not. A, look, he's not a thinker, right? I mean, so, yeah. so. But he's a leader and he's he's charismatic. And a oh, lot no. of I mean, he might, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised, depending on how this impeachment business goes, if he doesn't keep a very a publicly open the idea of running again in four years. And that's the real wild card in things. Uh, that's one of the reasons why conviction in the Senate uh, is such a high stakes matter. If, yeah. uh, uh, in my view, uh, American democracy doesn't work without two sort of mainstream uh, governing parties uh, who accept the legitimacy of their political opposition and are prepared to cut deals when, um, when it's possible and, and, uh, and necessary. Uh, so we will, we, will, we will see. Trump is, is uh, in some ways, his disappearance would give the Republicans an opportunity to rebuild and have some shred of chance of appealing to people under 50 years of age uh, uh, who are expect tolerance when it comes to matters having to do with personal reproductive uh, 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 rights and, and uh, same-sex arrangements and other life life choices. Uh, right, right now, it's a generation lost, uh, and they're going to be growing in size, uh, and some of those other Republicans are going to be leaving. And, and uh, Terry, you asked early on, uh, reminded us of Rice Priebus's effort to uh, have the Republican Party rethink, and they said, yeah, let's do it. Then Steve Bannon and uh, Donald Trump came along and they decided that uh, uh, we could win. There were enough still whites and white Democrats who weren't, who were Macomb County style Democrats who hadn't yet made the move to combine with a mobilized cultural right to, uh, to win the election. They haven't been winning the popular vote. Uh, in presidential elections, they won once. I believe it was 2004, except for that all of the others Democrats have won. And this time, Joe Biden won by 7 million plus, uh, plus votes. So Republicans, with its present posture, uh, 
can take advantage of the opportunities provided by our non-majoritarian elements of our constitution, including the uh, electoral college, the apportionment of the Senate, single member districts, uh, the appointment process and length of term of uh, members of the Supreme Court, they can take advantage of that and make a big difference. But eventually, if that big a part of the electorate is uh, sees nothing to appeal to it, then uh, they're going to be having a hard time doing it. So I hope they make the change. Good. Um, a question from our audience is about um, um, building on some of the, you know, I, Steve, you said that Trump received the highest share of non-white voters. Um, I haven't seen that number, but but why... Um, this this audience member wants to know why have minorities been voting more Republican elections? Will that trend continue? And why did that happen? Especially when you think about Trump's rhetoric. Uh, yeah. So, well, several reasons. One is, uh, and this has been very uh, poorly not it hasn't been reported at all. The Trump campaign did a superb job of reaching out, especially to Hispanics. And I could go through some of the very technical things that they did. I'll just mention one. For example. They didn't just do Spanish language radio ads. They actually went so far as to find out what radio stations do Hondurans listen to and Guatemalans. And they got someone to cut the radio ads for those stations who had a Honduran dialect as opposed to just a generic Spanish speaker. Uh, And I don't think Republicans had ever done that before. Um, And I think there's other parts to it. Uh, By the way, and then the question is the incompetence of not figuring out their weakness with suburban white voters, which is really where they lost the election. Um, uh, I also think um, Tom put a finger on a little bit. I'd put it a little more broadly about a lot of of, uh, minorities are culturally conservative. And, you know, there are surveys showing, for example, that a lot of Hispanics uh, have never heard of the phrase Latinx or Latinx, however you use it. And the ones who do hear about it don't like it. Uh, I think that an awful lot of, uh, uh, of the racial consciousness Tom is talking about, and it's a controversial thing to say, is actually much more fervently held by white liberals than it is by a lot of minorities. Now, I say Trump had the highest share. It's still 33% of Hispanics, which isn't world beating, and you know, 14% of black males and 10% of black females, or a gender gap there. Uh, but those are higher numbers than you've seen for quite a long time. Yeah, even and, George W. Bush. I thought George W. Bush uh, did did uh, supposedly he did very well in Texas and certain states. Uh, the thing about Trump is that he did he improved the Hispanic share everywhere, even in California. Uh, and so I think a lot of you know for certain number of minorities, they don't uh, they don't they're not bothered by Trump's personality. Some actually like it. I think. Mm-hmm. You know, Terry, we won't really know what those numbers are until we get the verified vote counts. Uh, 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 We depend upon exit polls and precinct returns and the rest. Uh, Where we know there was big change was in Dade County, Florida with the Cuban Americans and on the South Texas border. There were were issues that really riled them up and there was effective campaign um, efforts by, by Trump. So, but in the, basically the numbers, it, it's still the case that the, the turnout of blacks in Georgia made a real difference. Okay. We can look at the percentage changes, you know, they may have been less, but if you, if you really look, uh, Democrats would have lost, uh, their seats in the closest races, uh, had there been a serious uh, loss of support among non-whites. It was marginal. And Steve may be right, they may be onto something, but but my guess is uh, unless uh, they can appeal to young people, that's where the Latinos are. Uh, and and uh, unless they hide their white supremacists, uh, uh, they're never gonna move beyond uh, 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 10 or 12 percent among African Americans. Great. Um, 
The last question I have uh, for both of you uh, is to sort of uh, come back and get the, the bigger picture about you know, what are the implications of the Trump presidency for democratic governance? Uh, several political scientists have claimed that President Trump is a weak president. At the same time, many uh, uh, political scientists and others worry that pr Trump, President Trump has endangered democracy. Now, we can believe both of those things at the same time, but I, I wanna hear each of your thoughts on what kind of long-term impact has President Trump had on American democracy and really be concrete um, in, in, your, in your explanation, please. And let's start off with Steve first and then we'll end with Tom. So I think there's a, a, a beginning of an answer to this comes in two parts. Uh, one is uh, the more precise nature of executive power. You know, I have to say, I always found it amusing when Trump would do these signing statements in the White House and he'd pull up a thing, and he'd hold it up or he'd signed it. And some of them were consequential and some were purely symbolic. Uh, but it raised the question that's been boiling for a while. I mean, for a couple of decades now, at least, and will carry over into President Biden and beyond, uh, which is, uh, you know, Obama called that he had a pen and a phone. You know, how much can be done on executive authority? how much discretion has been ceded by Congress to the executive branch. This has become a very lively issue with the Supreme Court signaling for several years now that they're interested in rethinking and tweaking maybe substantially how much deference the judiciary gives to executive agencies. Uh, and so I think, you know, as uh, President Biden moves to undo things by executive action, uh, we may see some interesting wrinkles come along because the courts did constrain Trump on several areas. And some of those same constraints may apply to what Biden does. I'm thinking especially the DACA business. Um, uh, and so the point is, uh, Trump may be, I, I had hopes actually that Trump would provoke Congress, doesn't matter which party was running it, into uh, re reclaiming some more of its uh, prerogatives. Um, the, the second part of the question is about Trump endangering democracy. Um, I think that many aspects of that argument are overwrought, but there's no doubt that he, uh, he shattered what we call the informal, but nonetheless important norms of how presidents are supposed to behave and how they're supposed to conceive of their relationship with the American people, how they're at least supposed to try to speak on behalf of all the people, even if their governing agenda is a more partisan or ideological. Um, and you know, Trump, that, that's just not Trump's vibe, right? That was not his thing. And I think that, um, uh, I don't know if it endangers democracy, but it certainly does contribute, it certainly did contribute, may continue to contribute to the polarization of opinion in the country, which was already barreling along in a bad direction all by itself. Mm -hmm. So Steve, let me just push back on um, immigration. Um, you know, was that because uh, the, there wasn't really a, a, you know, the fact that, that the Supreme Court did not uphold uh, Trump's overturning of DACA was that it wasn't well justified, that, you know, they didn't go through all the, they, they didn't provide enough justification um, that was needed uh, to overturn DACA. And they, they, they weren't making a statement about presidential power when they turned that over. It was more a statement about, like, you just didn't follow the process right. Yeah, I mean, I thought, I'd have to go back and look. I thought what they said was he didn't actually go through the formal rulemaking process right. to overturn what Obama had done. Even though Obama's original DACA ruling was, I guess, based on prosecutorial discretion and some other things. Um, right. I've lost a little fine points in all of this. And uh, I thought, okay, that's interesting. Um, and... Uh, there were several, there's several other decisions. I mean, one of the early courts, I'm not sure it got the, he did get the Supreme Court and it ruled a couple of times. Mm -hmm. One of them was, yeah, he didn't support, you didn't give us good enough reasons. The census decision, that was another one. They struck down the, uh, the uh, changes the Trump people wanted to make on how the census was conducted. And there, I think they said, yeah, you, you haven't given us, uh, your reasoning is, uh, is weak. Um, so yeah, they didn't exactly say you couldn't do what you're supposed to do, but you we need to tighten up the procedures for all this. Um, so that may be a step in the right direction as far as rethinking the scope of executive power. Yeah, but do you think, I mean, do you think the Supreme Court is really rethinking its its um, stand on executive power or is it just a, a sort of a, a sort of more of a fine, fine point, putting a, you know, like you come back and if you do it right this time, 
you write, you know, if you, if you follow all the all the rules, you, you can definitely overturn DACA. You can uh, definitely um, do, you know, make these changes. I think it's both. I think the Supreme Court is wanting to rethink this, but of course, remember the Supreme Court likes to do things in little steps. They don't like to go have big sweeping rulings. And so that's a, that's a real dilemma for everybody. Yeah, okay, good. Um, Tom, what do you think? I'm not surprisingly more worried about the state of American democracy than, uh, than Steve is. Uh, I'm not surprised that we face some headwinds. Again, we've we we think uh, we saw signs of that uh, many years ago. Our, our politics has 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 changed, and yes, we've gone through uh, different kinds of challenges to our uh, democracy. Uh, 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 reading about the radical right in the 50s and the 60s, which was my wife's PhD dissertation topic, and then, and then following McCarthy and, uh, and, and seeing Pat Buchanan and, and, you know, we've, Father Coughlin going back in time, we've, we've had, uh, we've had scary authoritarian like uh, figures, Charles Lindbergh and, and the like, but this is really the first time we've elected a president and had a majority party in Congress that was prepared to let him do basically what he wanted to do as long as the, he did their, uh, their bidding. And I think many people in this country, uh, as well as around the globe, were terrified that American democracy was collapsing before our face. I think we've, we've had a reckoning with ourselves. We've rediscovered uh, the legacy of, uh, of slavery and uh, the overthrow of Reconstruction and Jim Crow in our society. And uh, one way or another, we're going, to, we're going to face up to it. I think we're saved, ironically, by the courts, uh, uh, in spite of all those appointments uh, by Donald Trump, the courts uh, ending with its 60 of them deciding that Trump and his lawyers had absolutely no grounds, no evidence, no argument to contest uh, the vote certified uh, uh, by the states and eventually uh, counted uh, in the Congress. I think while the social media has been very problematic for American democracy, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people in this country who are convinced they know what's happened uh, uh, to those poor children uh, at the behest of that pedophile Hillary Clinton, and there's nothing we can tell them uh, to the contrary, and they're finding their way to the Congress, and that's worrisome. But overall, the media um, um, at least called Trump out. It didn't, he figured out a way, he learned what, or knew instinctively what autocrats around the world have done. If you tell a lie, don't just tell it once. Uh, the more you tell it, the more likely it is to believe. Finally, I think civil society helped us uh, out. There was a mobilization before the uh, 2018 midterm election, and and that made a huge difference by giving a branch of Congress to control by the out party, and was the beginning, I think, of uh, uh, of the end of uh, of the Trump presidency. I think what happens to our democracy is up is up for grabs. Uh, we came so close to it being so much worse. Uh, Pence could have been killed. Pelosi could have been killed. There could have been a lot of blood uh, in the Capitol. Um, uh, we could have had, uh, you know, a relatively small number of votes reversed in a handful of states once again, as we did in 2016. Although at this time it would have given the victory to the candidate to the candidate who. Who, uh, who lost by over 7 million votes. So there, we, we came close. There are shortcomings in 
the law affecting the, the transition that have to be changed. Um, if we're going to overcome this, two things have to happen. Uh, one is we have to have some accountability. And uh, Donald Trump needs more than just being held to, to a single term. And I hope Republicans in the Senate uh, uh, see it as in the interest of their country as well as their own interest to uh, to convict him and and uh, keep him from uh, f- serving in other federal office uh, offices. Uh, so that's the one thing. Uh, it's also going to be important for the House uh, uh, to deal with members who've been absolute traitors in uh, in their midst from what they've said and done, and uh, they ought to be held accountable. There are staff members and members of Congress who are afraid to be around some Republican members of the House who like carrying their arms uh, wherever they go and talk about killing people. It's, uh, it's a little scary. We may need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, uh, uh, certainly the legacy of slavery is, uh, is, is with us and there's really just devastating research now. I read abstracts every day that, that show, uh, if you want to see how people are performing in, in say a neighborhood, um, uh, just go look to see what Jim Crow had produced, uh, back in the, the 20s and 30s, and it, it, it turns out where Jim Crow was weakest, uh, uh, and the, you know, the, the people moving, uh, in had other opportunities and they are doing much better. Raj Chetty, the economist, has done tremendous geographical, uh, mapping of all of this. So we've, we've got much to answer for, but, Basically, the Republican Party has to change. If we, I think another term of Trump, and I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have uh, certainly bet my retirement on uh, America retaining its democracy. I think, uh, I think a civil war is uh, might have been uh, more likely. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to keep our democracy. Great. Um... Steve, did you want to respond to what Tom um, just said? Or um, you- no, just to one point. I I like to let Tom go on <laughs> sometimes. Uh, I do think that one particular point, though. I can think of nothing worse than the House expelling a bunch of members. Uh, whatever you think of particular statements and things they did, and the reason for that is is that you know unlike the Senate, it takes several months to replace House members. You got to have a special election. The governors can't appoint them. And I think you will enrage uh, uh, all Republicans uh, who, because it will look like uh, getting rid of members so you can pass things more easily out of the House. Right now, Pelosi's got a big problem. She's got this very narrow margin of what, 10 votes or whatever it is. We're still waiting on one, one seat, I think, from New York. Uh, and you know, one way to pass stuff is to get rid of 20 or 30 Republicans. I don't think that would go down very well. And I think even a lot of uh, independents would think that was dirty pool. So really bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, you need only four or five of margins are so thin. No, I agree with Steve. I think it's better to censure and shame. Um, by the way, there was talk on the other side, you know, you, you kill a few Democratic members of the House and by God, the majority shifts uh, back to the Republican Party. Uh, so I think uh, de-escalating is good, but I think you can't allow... Uh, the Marjorie Taylor Greens and and our new member from Colorado who resisted going through a, a metal detector machine so she could carry her gun on the floor of the, the house. What's come out of her mouth uh, since being elected is uh, uh, is is so awful. Uh, at least bring the opprobrium of the Republican Party in the House upon her. Uh, uh, we need a, need a little spine for the, uh, for the Republican leader in the house. And it's, it's time to censure or, or, uh, uh, in, in some ways, uh, show, 
show coll uh, collegial uh, uh, disapproval of, uh, of their behavior. Great. Um, what, one of our uh, uh, audience members is asking, uh, what, what can Biden do to bring our country together after, after the last uh, you know, few months, the last four years? Uh, you know, and, and listening to a report this morning um, um, about people who voted for Trump and how they, they, they still trust Trump. Uh, they, they may not support the approve of the, the riot on the Capitol, but they still support Trump. How is, does Biden, is, is that beyond hope for Biden to reach out to those Trump voters? Is, is, or is that, is there something that he can do that you would recommend? I think there's something he can do. Uh, so I want to give you uh, give you a short answer. I don't think he should invite Mitch uh, to have uh, bourbon uh, or scotch with him because neither drink. Uh, I think I think the whole notion of reaching out is 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 really verbiage. It's said because the public wants to believe a fraction of it uh, that it would be good if people could come together. What he can do is legislate on matters that are important to the lives of uh, citizens. Uh, uh, the, the management of uh, the coronavirus pandemic has been disgraceful. It's, uh, it epitomizes cacistocracy and it, Trump's narcissism came to the fore. He, he got involved importantly at the beginning and pumping some federal money into uh, into vaccine research, and that paid dividends. But but then it wasn't fun anymore, and uh, he left it behind. And and uh, we got the vaccines, but we had no serious distribution system. So grabbing a hold of that, delivering a hundred million vaccinations in a hundred days sounds kind of hokey, but it's an important goal to set and to hit for him to direct his team to do everything possible to meet. I also think getting money in the hands of the people that are in those vehicles we see in every one of our cities lined up uh, for block after block that are coming to food banks because they simply wouldn't eat without it. Uh, uh, we, uh, we've had a, a K-shaped recovery you know, I, I haven't been hurt uh, financially during this, and I don't think Steve has, but uh, the, uh, a good number of people, at least half uh, people have been thrown out of their jobs and lost their small businesses, and, uh, and it's a tragedy. So produce results so that you have a chance of not saying, oh, I love my opponents, but, but government is important to your lives, and we're going to we're going to make it tend to your lives and your agenda. Pay attention, as Biden has said, to the entire electorate. Don't, as Trump did, eliminate one color of states, but, uh, but say you're going to try to help everywhere and then act on it. Uh, that would eventually produce uh, a very successful Democratic Party, even surviving a midterm election, although that's not a good call now uh, uh, because the margins are so thin. But in the end, I think it would create a better, a better Republican Party, and we need that. Steve, uh, we have five minutes left. So, uh, do you want to? What, what would be your advice for uh, President Biden? President. Yeah, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's going to pain me to be partly parallel to Tom, except I'm going to put it this way. I want to step back a little bit and draw our attention to the fact that the problem of severe polarization, which has been growing for years, it's not new with Trump or even Obama, um, I think it is related to a larger problem of our institutions in general, public and private. So I always like to point to the Gallup and Pew and other pollsters who do what they call the trust question or confidence question. And I, some of our viewers probably know this, that uh, you know back around 1960, when Gallup started asking the question, 75, 78% of Americans said they had confidence or high confidence in the federal government to govern effectively. It's been all downhill with a couple of 
brief uh, back eddies. One of them that was sustained was under Reagan, but only got back about two fifths of what had been lost in the 60s and 70s. And nowadays, confidence the federal government uh, will do the right thing is down around 15 percent. Now, it's not just government, not just central government. Uh, it's private institutions, the Boy Scouts, the Catholic Church because of their scandals, banks, uh, sports teams. Um, there are very few big institutions that have held up very well in the last few years. Um, uh, the military is one of them, and there's maybe a lesson there because they focus on their mission of killing people and breaking things. Uh, the police, uh, you know, they've been eroded a lot the last year for, because of the various controversies. Nonetheless, the, the point I draw about of that for a president is um, nothing succeeds like success. So, yeah, if, uh, if the Biden administration can get a handle on coronavirus and get the vaccines out faster, and then I think, by the way, I think there's going to be an economic boom. A lot of reasons why I think that, uh, regardless of what yep. stimulus may be done. Uh, then he has a wind at his back. Um, and I have I mean, lots of criticism, I think, about what he's doing. A lot of things he's going to do, I don't like the look so very much. Uh, but that's the big problem is how can you, how can Americans regain some trust and confidence in their institutions across the board? I don't have an answer for that. I don't know how to do it. Success helps some. Uh, but I think this is a much broader problem uh, than, I don't know, just polarization. I, I think it's the most serious problem we have, um, frankly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perry, that um, we're actually agreeing on a number of things. Trust in government is a, is a huge problem. Um, and we're likely, if we pass the stimulus that Biden will propose, um, uh, have a real economic recovery, uh, not a tepid one when Biden couldn't get a, I mean, Obama couldn't get a, a second and third uh, uh, stimulus going. Uh, we had steady increase in, 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 in uh, uh, employment, and that was a good thing, and modest increase in GDP, but that was... Uh, I think the consensus among mainstream economists is that we did too little, not that we did too much in terms of helping the economy. But this is a different kind of uh, uh, economic distress. It, uh, uh, we don't need to stimulate uh, 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 demand. There's a lot of demand waiting <laughs> to have an opportunity to uh, to go buy things and <laughs> and and so on, but we've got to get uh, the economy up and running, and then it's going to probably roll. So Biden may be fortunate to have a midterm elections with a with a really growing uh, economy. Uh, the second thing, though, uh, well, it's it's not it's it's an elaboration of the trust uh, where this comes from. Many many reasons. Uh, we've always had mistrust uh, in this country. Uh, uh, and Jim Wilson, uh, one of our dear friends and colleagues, departed some years ago, uh, reminded us that we were using as a baseline for measuring trust uh, uh, the post-World War II era when the economy was booming and we had won the war and defeated the bad guys. Uh, but then something happened. We, uh, we had a real end to Jim Crow. We had a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act. And, and politicians, some politicians, uh, uh, started seeing that there was some resentment among uh, the, uh, the larger white citizenry that too much of... Uh, the economic activity was going to the benefit of those who don't deserve it. And that became a theme of our politics and has never left us. Uh, I was present when uh, Newt Gingrich first came to Congress. Uh, Norm and I had him and other members of the class of 78 and a small discussion group that met over dinner uh, eight or 10 times, and I got to know Newt very well, but he was clear, he was a Rockefeller Republican who saw the handwriting and the changes and was tired of the Republicans being in the minority. And so he said the best, the best 
hope for us is to absolutely demonize the Congress uh, and the government uh, and the people who control it. And uh, uh, Newt made an art of that. And it became really a part of the toolbox of, uh, of the Republican Party. Norver, uh, Grover Norquist uh, uh, picked up uh, the pace after a while. But obviously, it's much more than that. Now there's discontent uh, of Republicans, you know, by Democrats and vice versa. It's it's more than that. But I I do think when you demonize government, uh, expecting anything other than a drop in trust in government is kind of insane. It's a uh, it's a result of a political strategy to gain and. Uh, and a whole power, and all we can do is uh, is try to call it out as as performative and not substantive, and does nothing to help the lives of uh, of Americans, and and uh, that's the goal of uh, of politicians who want who want being a member of Congress to be about something, to be solving some problems. Who does who don't believe in in a libertarian uh, uh, world in which government's main job is to get out of the way and let the economy roll. It's to become a little bit more uh, understanding and, uh, and generous and uh, smart. And so innovate and, uh, and improve productivity and make the economy grow, but understand We've got 20, 30 percent of this country, certainly of kids living in, in deep poverty, and they don't have much of a chance of doing anything about it. Imagine if we were able to bring most of those into the, the, the middle class. I mean, there'd be, uh, we would be one powerful uh, economic uh, machine. And frankly, we'd have some moral authority in the world. We've We've lost most of ours uh, over the last four years, and so we have a lot of work to do. We so. do have a lot of work to do. And uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our uh, seminar. So I wanna thank uh, uh, Steve and Tom for coming today and offering us uh, your insights into uh, politics and and what the future of, uh, of the you know, what the Biden presidency is going to look like and what are the ramifications of the Trump presidency. Uh, I hope uh, that we can continue the conversation. I know uh, the law school and the um, is, is thinking about doing more of these kinds of forums. And I, uh, so anyways, I, I urge if uh, the audience members, if you have ideas for future forums, if you could just put those in the chat, we'd love to hear your ideas. And I'm sorry, we did not get to more of your questions. Uh, but I hope we can answer some of them in future uh, seminars. So thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.